on uh, 45 minutes south of Salt Lake City. Gotcha. And uh, we've got, I'm going to show you our group here. We got about 40 people. Nice. Eight. Good turnout. Hey, guys. Kind of a, I'm trying to, trying to see. It's kind of weird. I, I'm not used to, <laughs> not, this is a camera that I'm not used to functioning. So, um, and uh, thanks so much. I mean, I, we've had a long day and a big night, uh, a screening and a Q and A already. And now, you, <laughs> now you jump into this. Yeah. So I think, I guess the first question I want to ask you just because I'm curious is, uh, what's the latest project that you're screening now? It's called Thank You for Your Service, and it's about uh, veteran war trauma. And actually, one of my characters lives in uh, Ogden, Utah. Oh. And so I was, I was up there about a year and a half ago shooting him and his family. And he actually lived in Croydon. I think he's way out in the middle of nowhere. It's like one road. Hmm. You know where Croydon know. is? Yeah. It's yeah. like 45. It's 40 minutes north, I think, of Salt Lake. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, it's a tough film. It's about war trauma, moral injury. Very different from casting by. Sure. So now I'm finishing another film that I'm in post on, which is another Hollywood film about a character actor named Robert Davi, who was in The Goonies. He's the guy with kind of the scary, scary face. I shouldn't say this on YouTube, but uh, he's a great guy. He loves Frank Sinatra. And it's all about him spending a year trying to put on a great Sinatra tribute for Sinatra's 100th birthday. Wow. And it's a kind of a serial comic film. So, again, very different from war trauma. Yeah, you're, you're, <laughs> bounc to alternate. you're bouncing around a bit. Yep. Yeah. So the screening went all right? Yeah, it went really well. It's wow. always very emotional. Well, thanks for running back and jumping up with us. So, all right, so I've been, you know, I, I looked into how this came to be. And so I've got some questions. And, and, and I've, I know because I've read some of interviews with you, but right. they may not know. So let me just first ask, how did the Casting by Project start? Um, and if you want to just, and then I'll, I'll go in from there with a few questions I had after that. But. Sure. Well, I, I knew a casting director named Joanna Colbert, who uh, was head of casting at Universal for nine years. And she and I, every time I came to L.A., we'd go to Coffee Bean and get a, uh, a coffee. And she said, I know how we can work together. And I said, oh, how's that? And uh, she said, there's this woman named Marion Doherty. Do you know who that is? And I was like, no, I have no idea. She says, well, she's this legendary casting director. Everyone in Hollywood knows who she is. Nobody's ever done a movie about her. At the very least, maybe you could look into her. You could do an interview with her. She's 85. She's got incredible stories that nobody's ever told. And I said, let me get back to you. And I went, you know, I looked on Google and there was about a three page interview from a college newspaper from, I think, Ohio. Wow. Uh, an interview with Mary. And it blew my mind. I'm like, how come there's nothing else on this woman? So I agreed to do this interview and uh, it blew my mind. 12 hours of interview, incredible stories. And then that journey continued on to 200 other people. And at that point, within the year that I'd interviewed Marion, she got dementia. Mm. So Marion, within a year, Marion forgot most of her history and everything she told me. So suddenly her memory was kind of on my hard drive. And I knew I had to, I had to finish the movie. And as I went along with Marion not having remembered anything, I would interview, you know, Juliet Taylor and Juliet would offhand say, you know, Oh, uh, Marion did the pilot for All in the Family. And I'd be like, oh, I'll go get Norman Lear and find out that it was Marion who was responsible for it. They probably, your class probably doesn't know All in the Family. But for me, it was a they seminal, know. oh, they do, it's cool. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a seminal, a seminal point in my life when I saw that show, it was so groundbreaking. Sure. And yeah. that was Marion Doherty, right? It was all about right. the casting. Amazing. So. Yeah, the, um, so, so you went, so, so she passed away in 2011? No. When, yes. So when did you film her? December. I filmed her in 07. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, um, and so you were working on this project for a long time. Yeah, I was finishing. I did a project on the art world called Guest of Cindy Sherman. So that, yeah. that premiered at Tribeca uh, in 2008, and then I went theatrical in 09. So while I was doing that, this, these docs tend to, at that point in my career anyway, because there wasn't a lot of money at that point, right. and the docs would percolate. So I'd get Marion, then I'd get Diane Lane and Glenn Close and Julia Taylor, slowly start building momentum and actually started posting photographs with me and Robert Redford and me and George Lucas. And uh, that attracted actually investors from Connecticut. And uh -huh. I was able to get the film financed through Facebook, which is interesting, right? Right. Uh, so Those investors from Connecticut, you know, they always come out. Yeah, of yeah. And they were, they were, one of them was related to someone who went to college. It was a total right. strange connection, but it worked out really well. Huh. And so, 
Um, so, uh, well, the, the big question that I'm sure, I mean, you've sort of answered, but, you know, having produced some documentaries before and knowing sometimes how hard it is to get people of note to sit down for a documentary. In fact, I've tried to interview Norman Lear and oh. had, it, had it set up and then had it canceled like the week before and oh. all these sort of things. So, I mean, how, I mean, I feel like you're going to just say, well, it was a project about Marion, but uh, tell me a little bit about. Yeah, this. well, you know, the key, the thing, you're right. It's a project about Marion. Therefore, you call Clint Eastwood or Bette Midler and they say yes, right? Although there were some that said, let me see who else ends up in the movie. Like, in other words, is this really a real thing? Go right. down the road a little and then come back and ask me again. And right. there were a few that were like that. But uh, Clint Eastwood said yes right away. Bette Midler did. But took three years to get Bette Midler in front of the camera. It took two years to get Clint Eastwood in front of the camera. So I had this producer who was uh, an executive in charge of casting, uh, an associate at Disney. Her name is Kate Lacey. So Joanna and Kate, this is how this all came about. Joanna and Kate were casting Step Up and they were in the process of discovering Channing Tatum, right? And mm -hmm. they were on hold. And, and uh, Joanna was like, oh, and so how did you get your start? And Kate's like, oh, I interned under Marion Doherty. I was, you know, she was my first job. And, and uh, Joanna said, oh my God, I work for Julia Taylor, the granddaughter, right? Basically the first assistant of Marion Doherty. So they realized they had this connection and they said, oh my God, we have to do a movie about Marion Doherty. I know this guy, Tom in New York. I should ask him next time I have coffee with him. So that's where that started while they were on hold casting Channing Tatum. Hmm. <laughs> I forgot my point. Oh, so then, you know, we go about, we get, uh, basically everyone, nobody could say no to Kate. It's like she would only take yes for an answer, even if it took years. So yes. Clint Eastwood, after a year, he would say yes, the assistant would change. So the assistant who knew Kate and developed a relationship with her and kept holding her off would change into someone new that Kate had to develop a relationship with. So Kate knew every manager and every agent because having worked at Disney and casting, she had developed those relationships. So all of that helped in getting these people in front of the camera. Oh, I, oh absolutely. So it wasn't you just as this documentarian calling people. It was a casting director. Pretty much means. someone who was in that world. Yeah, yeah I think that's true. If you're going to make a documentary, find an advocate in that world to make it win. Right. right? That gives you legitimacy. Right, right. So tell me, you're doing all these different things. I'm going to ask one more question, then we're going to open it up to questions. Um, you're doing all these different types of documentaries, right? And I know you did the, the Sidney Sherman documentary and, uh, and now the, the military, all these different things. How do you, how do you choose a project? Uh, God. <laughs> you know, they, it's like a lot of opportunities come at you and you have to say no to some. Some of them you want to say yes to and they – literally will fall apart. You could even get some financing and it never totally manifests into a final project. Other ones, the money comes at you and you do, you know, the Robert Davi doc that I'm finishing now was a guy who saw casting by and loved it and uh, saw casting by through Martin Scorsese's casting director, Ellen Lewis, hmm. loved it. And at that moment, Robert Davi came to him about a project and it was just a perfect storm, everything hmm. happening at the right time to make it happen. So sometimes it's kismet and sometimes you have an idea and you go and you, try to piece the money together. It's, it's always a crapshoot, which one ends up being finished. I always right. say a little, every film that's finished is like a little miracle. So I don't know how they come together, but they do. Right. That's, that's a recurring theme that uh, I, as we do this month after month, that's, we hear a lot about the little miracles. Right. Um, uh, I did want to ask one, uh, another question before I turned it over, just because I'm selfish. So, <laughs> so I know when your film came out, there was a change in the academy allowing a casting director uh, category, not for an no, award, but not, not for an not, award. But well, for here, here's what happened. So I would sit with casting directors and I would say, I'm going to, with this film, you're going to get an Oscar, right? And the casting directors would poo poo me and say, we don't even have a branch at the academy. Right. Publicists have a branch. Right. Uh, we don't. That's crazy. So until we get a branch, we're never going to get a, an Oscar. So the academy, the academy knew. Uh, about a year before the film was coming out on HBO that it was going to. And one of the casting directors with good relationships in the Academy started showing pieces of the film and saying, you better get in front of this because it's going to be embarrassing. And so the, and certainly with the issues, the Academy, now it's about diversity. And at that point, there were some issues with, with women in the Academy. So it was kind of good timing. 
And five days before the film ca came out on HBO, the Academy issued a press release saying, we are uh, creating a casting branch for the Academy. So it was able to help inoculate them a bit against the film. The cool thing is when the film came out too, the Emmys actually uh, gave Marion their highest achievement, the Governor's Award, which is really incredible. Once again, TV is always kind of ahead of the motion picture. Right. And has there been uh, any any progress? Uh, I mean, any later, you know? Well, you know, it's a slow thing. What happens is by, by getting a branch, suddenly there's some board of governors uh, who are now casting directors. So now the casting directors have a certain amount of power, certain amount of say, and I think it's inevitable that, and also this film has gotten into the kind of the cultural bloodstream of Hollywood. We right. call people to get people in front of a camera for an, an, any new film we're doing. And it's like, oh my God, I love casting by, let me, you know, let right. me call them and get them scheduled. So it's much easier now to get talent than it was then. Okay, I still have one more question. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so I, I can never remember his name. He's married to, uh, what's her name? Uh, can't remember her name either. Helen Mern. Helen Mern, right. What's his name again? The Taylor Hackford. Yeah. Right. Who I so, love. boy, you make him look like a chump. No, I don't. He makes himself no, look like that. Right. <laughs> That's the beauty of an interview. Right. Um, you know, I purposely didn't manipulate it. Like, I originally had a track of music under him, and I'm like, you know what? What he's saying is so, uh, it's like dynamite. I'm just right. going to play, play it straight. I'm not going to cut it and let him do that on his own. And I was very proud of him to say that on camera because casting directors told me that other people in the film, other directors that you see in the movie, have the same attitude that Taylor has, but they'll right. never say it on camera. So right. you got it, you know, Taylor's got some cojones. To, uh, yeah, yeah. You give him credit for that. Right, sure. Well, okay, I'm going to turn this over. Okay, who wants to come up? Come on up. Come this, on up. This is the time when they all sit there and get shy. <laughs> but we'll be sure to, they'll, they'll tell you their name. Okay. Okay, good. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Nick. Hey, Nick. And I, I have a question going kind of back to you talked about how you got the talent and people to sit down for interviews. How did you kind of decide who to interview? Cause I mean, you have hundreds of individuals that have been touched by this individual and in, in their lives and their careers. How did you decide who would be the most important people to actually sit down with yeah. to hear their stories? Well, the problem is I could talk to anybody. So it's kind of like I ended up with yeah. 240 interviews Whoa. sometimes ranging from an hour to two hours. And many didn't make the cut. Like George Lucas gave us oh. a two hour tour of ILM and then sat down for a half hour and gave me a great interview, gave me advice on the Academy. And, and then I had ultimately had to cut him out of the film because he wasn't part of the main spine of the story. He was related to another casting director. So I, initially I didn't have the confidence that the film could be carried by the story of Marion Doherty, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So I had these other casting directors and I was going out to, you know, Francis Coppola and these casting directors like Fred Roos, who did Apocalypse Now and American Graffiti. And I was fought Mike Fenton, who cast One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. All brilliant jobs. But I couldn't make a film that was just going to be one casting director story after another with no character arc. So I did a ton of interviews that ultimately, I, I think there's 52 films, uh, interviews in the film out of 240 that I oh. did. So telling people they weren't in the film is always, always difficult. Uh, so... Really, it was kind of embarrassing, and I don't have much of a – it's hard for me to say no to doing it. Like, Norman Lear wants to be interviewed. Oh, I'm going to interview Norman Lear. Jeff Bridges, I'm going to interview Jeff Bridges, John Travolta, Jennifer Beals, Brooke Shields got cut out. I cut out Morgan Freeman and Paul Rudd and Channing Tatum. and it, It's tough, but ultimately you learn – I learn so much from these people that in the way I'm, I'm selfish by interviewing them because I can learn so much from talking to them. Okay. So but I'll you... say another – let me say another thing about – making a documentary, because when I made Thank You for Your Service, I, I was not in the military. I'm not a behavioral health specialist, but here I am making a documentary about mental health in the military. So by talking to people in that space, whether it's General Petraeus, Defense Secretary Robert Gates, or you know a Navy psychologist, you are immersing yourself. And so it's not about putting all those interviews in the final film, right? It's about you're educating yourself about the topic, and then you become an authority. I spoke to this person about this. I spoke to that person about that. It gives you this really layered understanding of the problem. So to kind of keep going with that, how with that documentary, how did you decide who to go out and interview? Um, did you just look up for people that were leading in research with mental illness in the military? Or 
Yeah, it could be I read, I read a book and then we got in touch with the person who wrote the book or I read about a veteran in The New Yorker and we got in touch with the veteran or the, or the author of that article. Uh, Nicholas Kristof, the New York Times op-ed columnist, wrote a, an op-ed piece and I, we got in touch, put him on camera. So it was like, you, and then after, once you're in it, you meet people in the world, they introduce you to other people. Mm -hmm. So I would go and I would follow one veteran story and he would say, hey, my friend Phil's coming over. Do you mind if, you know, if he comes and watches us? And I go, sure. Hey, Phil, you want to go on camera? And Phil's story blows your mind. You know, that's that's kind of what happens. You go down that rabbit hole. It can be dangerous because you run out of money and you're still <laughs> like by the time I got to Utah, I was on my own with a camera. And, you know, it's tough. Oh, wow. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching the film, guys. Uh, my name's Danny. I'm uh, this is kind of a continuation of what. Uh, Nick had said, um, what kind of helped you decide which films to kind of emphasize in this film, film, like, you know, the Butch Cassidy Sundance Kid, uh, Pulp Fiction and many of the other films. Yeah. That, was it the interviews that helped it or was it working the interviews around what you decided? On? Well, good, good question. You know, it, it, like I said, initially, I didn't know the spine was Marion Doherty because I was very insecure about it, about this old woman to be, you know, Frank telling these stories, right? It could get monotonous. And every story is also the same. Every story is, here's an actor who's struggling. Here's a casting director that believes in that actor. And then that actor hits it big. So with every story, I had to say, how is each story different from the other story? And how is the history of casting explicated through each of these stories? So that was the trick. And then once you know that, and once you know the event in each interview, you decide which of the movie clips are going to illustrate that event. Hmm. Well, thanks. That actually answered my question very well. Cool. Thank you. Not sure if you'll be able to see me. I'm like on my TV. I see you. Okay, this is me normally. Um, I have a question. Ah. Oh, oh, oh okay. look! Now you can see yeah. me. Okay, I have a question about how to ask questions i mean <laughs> as you kind of went around asking questions how do you, do you prepare like do you have a list of questions or you just kind of are like okay just like let me know your story because there's obviously so much to try to figure out from each person right exactly well you know it's you have interns and a researcher but you also have to do a lot of the work yourself so you just immerse yourself you'll read the book you'll read articles about them you end up learning so much that you don't need to know except that it gives you the confidence to say, I know who this person is. I, I've seen interviews with them on YouTube. I know how they talk. I know what kind of questions they like and respond to. So you, it, it's not even that you're doing it purposefully. You're just immersing yourself in that person's world. And then you ask the questions you need to ask. And then, then it becomes this conversation. And always, you know, now I use two cameras. And I always say, I'm not looking for sound bites or one-liners. We're just going to have a conversation. But you have to, when you're having the conversation, know not to step on them not to laugh in the middle of a line of theirs. You have to like, but you do need to acknowledge them. So the trick is when they're in a mid, they're a little, there's a little space and they're talking, you have to go, mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. but, but not hit their actual words because my background is editing. <clears throat> and that's the worst thing when you hear yourself in the uh, dialogue and you got to change it out. Yeah. So it's, I guess it's a bit of a craft, but you get, it becomes second nature after a while. Perfect, thank you. But it's you. not a regular conversation. You don't, they don't care what you think. The camera doesn't care what you think. You say as little as possible to get them to talk. Oh, and well, okay, let me say one more thing that's actually a great piece of advice is don't talk. If you don't talk, the other person will, by human nature, fill in the silence and keep talking. So they end up going down roads that they probably shouldn't go down, Taylor Hackford, and they just kind of keep going. And you don't say anything. You just nod and listen. Let them keep going. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, hi, I'm Sterling. Hey, Sterling. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, you talked about how you spent like four years making this film, right? And four it years, not 40. Four years. Right? Four years, good, okay. Four years, and it sounds like you had other things going on at the same time. Um, yeah. how, many, how many films, you know, how many um, documentaries, how many projects are you usually working on at one time? Probably, I would say maybe three. So like use one, say that you're still putting the financing together on. Another one you're shooting and another one you're in post on. And actually maybe one that's in theaters or 
like now is going to film festivals and private screenings. And so you're, you juggle a lot because documentary film, you, you have to do a lot to make money to live. You know, you got to kind of keep all the balls in the air. And not only that, it's like, once that one's done, you better be on to your next one. It takes a while to get them all going. So you can't just, I mean, some people are so obsessive with one thing that they can spend years just doing that. Meanwhile, they're making money bartending or their accountants or whatever. But for me, I make films. So I, I keep my little mini studio rolling along by making movies. That's cool. Um, so my other question with that is, um, one of my questions is just kind of what you already talked about. You have all the balls in the air. Like just talk about like, how do you, how do you balance that? <laughs> if you're working on three or four projects, how do you give each one the focus it needs and still kind of keep yeah. your sanity? And I, I think you have to have a level of ADD and hyper focus. So you can, fo like uh, my background's editing. So obviously I can, I can get in there. I can have a relationship with the footage and really invest in it. But then I can also, when I'm not doing that, I'm all over the place juggling stuff. And I like both. I find both those things very exciting. Like today I was in post on, my current film then i went and did a screening of thank you for your service and had a q a and now i'm talking about casting by at 10 o'clock at night you know so it scrambles your brain but i can't do that every day i'd probably blow up <laughs> it takes a lot of cognitive ability to keep it all straight <laughs> do you ever um since it's with documentaries i mean you're kind of waiting for the people that you want to interview to essentially get back to you right that's and a good point yeah people for interview. do you ever shoot multiple documentaries at the same time are yeah, yeah. Well, I go to LA a lot. So if I'm in LA, like I'm doing a documentary on Dean Martin. It's his 100th birthday in 2017. So I'll be in LA and I'll be like, okay, I got to get this, you know, 90, I got to get Jerry Lewis. He's 90. So no matter what, I'm going to get Jerry Lewis when I'm at in LA. But then I can do, uh, I can get somebody for this documentary. And then on Thursday, I can get someone for this documentary because you're right. These people take forever to schedule. So you can have three documentaries going on at once that are shooting in and around Hollywood and Los Angeles and just kind of keep growing the number of interviews for each one. The key is to keep, to stay story focused with each film and know which film. I have been in weird situations where I'm going to interview someone and I have to remember which movie I'm doing. It gets kind of strange. I might ask them the wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do have to ask one other question and this one, I don't know, cause I'm not really familiar with like, you know, your whole body of work outside of casting by. But uh, I've seen a lot of documentaries where people just kind of like embed themselves in someone's life, right? Where as part from interviews, they just kind of follow someone around and they're just kind of there, just kind of yeah. watch people. Do you, have you done anything like that? And if so, how do you do that? Well, I don't, I don't live with them, but like Robert Davi, who, who's the documentary I'm posting now, I spent a year with him uh, going to different events and, and also with the, the soldiers, the veterans that I followed. I did a lot of immersive stuff. Like I would spend weekends with them and, and just kind of shoot them. And Kenny in, in Ogden and Croydon would take me around Utah to the, the well, Belvoir Reservoir. And, you know, we'd go to different places. Uh, but I've never actually stayed with one person. for I, My life's a little too busy to be able to kind of commit. Like, I, I don't know if I could go to Afghanistan for a year and make a doc about a village in Afghanistan. It's not really, it's not the kind of thing that, that I, I would be able to do personally. Although I'm sure it would be amazing. <laughs> Just not my thing to focus on one thing at once. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks for answering my questions. Thank you, man. How are you holding up, Tom? Good. Okay. You no sure? Supposed to be over here. Good. All right. Call the plug. Just let us know. Hi. Of course. Yeah. Hi. I'm, uh, I'm Jay. I just have a quick question. Hey, uh, I have a few questions. One was, uh, how did you manage your budget? What, what was your budget on this film? And how much did it apply to the talent? Like, did they have to ask for 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 money or was it a lot of the goodness of their heart for Marion? Yeah, no, I never pay for interviews for anyone because it, okay. there's a certain journalistic integrity. If you're going in front of the camera, you're doing it. It's real life. You're not You're not an actor. There's no SAG rule that says I need to pay these people as actors because they're not acting. They're playing themselves. So their ag agents were completely fine with them just you know, being in front of camera without any, like, there wasn't any push-pull. Yeah, the only, the only thing that costs money is, and mostly in the, the female actors, is hair and makeup. Okay. If that gets demanded, then you're dealing with, like, a $1,200, $1,500 fee, and you try to bring that down to 150 if you're lucky. Okay. And most of them were really cool, and they just did their own hair and makeup, and they walked in front of the camera. Oh, nice. Um, and one of my other questions was, you were able to sit down with a lot of, you know, 
uh, directors, filmmakers, and being a director yourself, like one, who were you, not starstruck, but like one of the, you were just really excited to, to sit down and just talk to. And what was like one of the biggest like pieces of advice, like, or something that you've learned from those directors? Well, directors oh. are actors too, though. Yeah. Uh, I would say uh, Taylor Hackford really inspired me by saying casting directors don't really help with anything. I thought that was fascinating. I learned a lot from him. No, I'm teasing. I'm just teasing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, John Travolta was an amazing, amazing interview. Like the guy is just so, he's so wise. He's so charismatic. Uh, you know, Martin Scorsese and the way he talked about film and movies and the way he broke it down. You know, when I started talking about casting and film, he's like, well, you're not talking about experimental films, right? You're talking about classic Hollywood films. I'm like, of course I'm talking about, yeah, I'm not talking about experimental, but, but I mean, that's where his brain went, right? Like there's a lot of time, there's a lot of cinema and we're only talking here about classic Hollywood cinema and how casting is important for that. Uh, but in terms of who inspired me, you know, I can't, I think, you know, it, getting to meet George Lucas, who I grew up, you know, I was a big fan of Star Wars when I was nine years old. So getting to meet him and talk to him was cool. Nice. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Oh, it does, it does, definitely. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Great, thank you. What am I looking at? What's this hallway? <laughs> it's the side of the stage. And oh, I, oh, it's a side. Okay. There's storage, like cool. behind. So it's not the bathroom there, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's just where they hide things. Gotcha. So my name's Kimber. Hey, um, I was wondering, how do you work with someone that you don't like? <laughs> Like making documentaries, you're going to run in, you want to run into people that have a different point of view than you or disagree with the argument you're making. But how do you, do you worry about maintaining a good working relationship with them? Well, or well which, which kind of person are you talking about? The subject or the um, people behind the camera? Someone that you're interviewing. Oh, oh, I, I like everybody. I mean, I think it's more like, you know, if you're an actor and you play a serial killer, you can't mm -hmm. judge that serial killer. You have to be that serial killer. So it's like when you're when you're talking to a subject, you just need to you need to meet them at where they're at. You know, and I, I've never interviewed Adolf Hitler or anyone like that. So I, I'm talking from the point of, view of interviewing actors and, and traumatized veterans who served their country. So I, I've never really met anyone I abs or, or interviewed anyone I despised. So I can't I can't totally answer that. But I would say I would interview them as dispassionately as possible to get what I need for my story. That would be my Machiavellian response. Okay. And yeah. don't say anything that's going to close them off or that's going to, you know, make them uh, not answer your questions the way you want them to. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. You guys are great. Let's do, I think, one more. I think this will be our last. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Mikkel. Hey, Mikkel. Um, I, you talked a lot about Dustin Hoffman. I know that he got affected a lot by Marion's work. Well, did you ever have an opportunity to talk to him at all? No, God, what a great question, because that was the one human being. Well, you remember I said Kate Lacey, my producer, never takes no for an answer? Well, we got a no from Dustin Hoffman like four times until I think he broke down and said, I'm not doing it! So we weren't expecting that, but for some reason he didn't want to be in the film, and, and ultimately we couldn't get him. So I used that little piece of archival in there to be Dustin Hoffman. So no, I never got to meet him and I would love to have, have met him. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was really fascinating. One, is there anyone else? Come on guys, one more, the best one. So good to go. I'm not getting yeah. off the hangout until I get another one. We got one more, and then I'll. Good. Howdy, I'm Bob. One of the adjuncts here. Um, question for the students. Hold on, Bob. You're on the Caesar. There we are, Bob. You're yeah. There you go. Yeah, I'm taller than the short one. But um, archival footage and uh, rights to the movie clips that you used. Uh, would you talk to them about those? Yeah, yeah. So we, we do something called we claim fair use. So I think there's 61 or 62 movie clips in the film. Uh, it would cost millions of dollars to actually pay for each of those. It's something like seven to $10,000 for a minimum for 30 second use. 60 clips, that's a lot of money. So instead they were free because as a documentary, you're educational and historical and therefore it has a, a public use that's beneficial to the public. So you claim that, you spend about $5,000 on a lawyer who looks at it, goes, goes through it frame by frame, make sure there's no legal issues, that everything is within the bounds of fair use. And then they write up an opinion letter and they submit it. 
and then you're able to get your errors and omission insurance, which if you're going to show on HBO, they require that. And then you can show the film. And then if the film gets sued, you have this errors and omission insurance. The cool thing is the studios don't sue because they don't want to go up against the fair use doctrine because they've gone up against the fair use doctrine and they've lost and it's been made worse for them. So they let it alone, you know, and nobody is. And also this is a film that nobody would really want to. It's about an older woman who's an unsung hero and nobody's going to go after the movie clips on that. Well, and there's a certain benefit just for the uh, advertisement of their product again. There, but you know, they never seem to care about that. They always want to make money. It's so maybe not for the studios, for musicians, for uh, music companies, it's so hard to make money these days in other ways that it's a, music. It's very hard to fair use. That's a very different situation than film clips. Right. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank so you, guys. Response, you know, Thanks, you, talked, you talked about immersing your, by, in your interviews, how much you learned from these people. And I think we've all learned a ton from you. Um, and I just really appreciate the time. And uh, thank you so much for staying up late for us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Dwayne. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Good luck. Turning off the broadcast.